welcome to Capital Combat. The name says it all. I'm Hakeem Branch. Rob Jarrell. And today we're going to recap this past Saturday's PAC boxing event, or this past weekend's, because on Friday we had Nathan Cleverly versus Andrew Fonfaro. Then on Saturday afternoon we had Lamont Peterson versus uh, Joseph Diaz. Then we had a pay per view in the evening. We covered Roman Gonzalez versus Ryan Valoria and Gennady Golovkin versus David Lemieux. Of course, that was a packed fight card with multiple fights on each card, but those were the four that we previewed. So those are the four that we're going to review here because reviewing four fights takes a lot of time. So we're going to stick with those ones, and we're going to start with Cleverly from far, go in chronological order all the way up to uh, Golovkin Lemieux. Get it started, Rob. All right, so in this fight, we had one guy said, all right, I'm going to throw a lot of punches. The other guy said, I'm going to throw a lot of punches. And what we got was a back and forth punch fest. I believe they th both of them threw over a thousand punches in this fight. I think they totaled, actually, I want to say they totaled 20, like 23, 2400 punches between the two of them, which okay. is insane over 12 oh, rounds. Okay. So these guys had no fear, and I'm going to be honest, they had no power. So they said they're just going to keep throwing punches. Hey, you got to make the best of what you got. And the thing that I liked about it was that they were still technically sound when they were throwing all these punches. Except for Fanfara leaving his feet a few times as he punched. He was trying to punch and move at the same time. But they both kept their guards up so they had to punch around each other's guard. Uh, they both punched with crisp, clean combinations even late into the fight. That shows that they were very, very conditioned to keep throwing that many punches, even if there's not a lot of power to just move your arms that far, just shadow box really hard for three or four rounds and you can be tired. These guys were actually hitting somebody and being hit for 12 rounds. I was impressed. Now what we noticed and what we talked about is that um, Clubley would start fast and uh, he would um, fade late Well, for far he kind of keeps it, he gets stronger as the fight goes on. And that's exactly what happened. Granted, both of these guys were throwing plenty of punches, but cleverly, again, started fast, was faster, um, but kind of the work rate kind of went down as from far started coming on um, as the fight went on. Yeah. And again, these guys were just going toe to toe. Uh, I think cleverly might have kind of um, muted his own power or potential power for the fight while Fafara fought taller but they still landed very crisp punches um, cleverly landed plenty of great looking uppercuts toward Fafara um, and Fafara worked the body but again with him he was able to keep up the work rate though two three four punch combinations at a time yeah well cleverly began to be like one to two punches at a time even though he was landing but Fanfara would still throw three to four punch combinations and I think that's what swung the fight in his favor so maybe they do it again maybe they move on who knows I would I would enjoy to see it again if, if they're gonna fight like that that was great um let's move on to the next fight which is uh Lamont Peterson versus I said was it Diaz? It's Diaz. Is, is it Felix or it's Felix Diaz. I said something different earlier. Yeah, Felix Diaz Jr., I believe. Yeah, sorry about that. I'll I put the edit down bottom. But yeah, it's Felix Diaz Jr. And in this one, um, we had talked about Diaz not ha seeing the pro competition that Lamont Peterson had. And, would be able, and that would be the, I guess, the, the turning point of that fight. At Lamar Peterson's pro experience versus Diaz's extensive amateur experience. Which he's had over 200 fights. Uh, and, 200 and, amateur. And a gold medal. Right. But he hadn't seen any of that pro caliber, that high pro caliber yet. And in this one, we got a very competitive contest, which seemed to be a combination of a few things. One, Diaz rising to the occasion and being better than everyone thought he was. Two, uh, the old adage of Styles making fights because the last few guys that Peterson fought he was able to start walking down whereas with Diaz, Diaz was like I'm not going anywhere and I'm staying right here and three we think that Peterson has outgrown that division and needs to move up because he looked 
pretty listless at times. Yeah, granted, this fight was fought at 144. Yeah. But Peterson, who's a little bit taller and a pretty heavily muscled guy, especially, I think he walked in at what, about 160? Yeah, it was, it was pretty high. Yeah, it was pretty high, especially for 144, and especially when they were at 140. But what I did see is that Diaz was quicker, had better movement, and he was less afraid to let his punches go. He was just, he would reel them off. They both went to the body well. But at times, it was kind of like a give and take. Um, Peterson would not have any activity. But then toward the end of the round, maybe in the last 90, 60, 90 seconds, he would start, again, walking Felix down, which he did catch him against the ropes. And you can see the, the size difference really did make a difference. Because he did go to the body very well, especially against a guy who was a shorter fighter. Yeah, and uh, I think that worked especially a lot towards the later rounds. Uh, Diaz began to move a lot more than he was returning fire, and that kind of helped Peterson out a lot. Mm -hmm. um, also want to give credit to Diaz for his head movement because he kept that going throughout the entire fight. A lot of guys come out maybe the first few rounds and are moving their head, then forget but he was doing it late into the fight, which also kept Peterson off guard as well and opened up a few counters for that uh, left hand that he was landing pretty precisely. Now, what they were talking about in uh, Peterson's training camp, which personally I think is excessive, but they might have sparred like, what do you say, 200 rounds in this uh, training camp? And sometimes as much as what, 20, like 20 rounds a day or something like it was some insane amount of sparring that he went through which that's a lot of sparring I think not yeah. 200 rounds somewhere between 200 500 I can't remember off the top of my head but it was an insane amount of sparring rounds yeah um it shows that he's really hungry and he really wants it but he may have overdone it so as good a coach as Barry Hunter is I'm sure I'm Pretty sure that they probably didn't go that high, but having been to that gym and knowing how they work, it could be possible. Those guys go pretty hard in D.C. Mm -hmm. um, I've taken some of my fighters there to work uh, with those guys, and, and they get it in. So it could be possible. Uh, that that uh, DMV area up there, uh, Southern Maryland, D.C., Northern Virginia, those guys work pretty hard up there, and um, like I said, it could happen, but I, I'm not 100% sure that it did. So if it did, hopefully they learn from that and see that performance, be like, hey, we need to kick it back some, and then go from there. But we both feel that Peterson should go up to the full 147-pound limit. Right. Because the cat, even the catch weights are starting to make him struggle a little bit. So with that, we'll see what he does next. We'll see what Diaz does next because he showed a, made a great account of himself in that fight. So I'm sure he's going to get another opportunity. Maybe for a belt at 140 if Peterson leaves because he has one belt and can vacate that belt. That's right. So let's move on to the pay-per-view portion of this fight weekend where we had a great pay-per-view matchup. We had uh, Roman Gonzalez versus Brian Valoria and David Lemieux versus Gennady Golovkin. Uh, with Gonzalez and Valoria, we talked about two very sharp, very technically sound guys who can punch. One of whom was a little bit more durable, a little bit sharper than the other, and that was Gonzalez. That's pretty much what we got in the fight. Though he really had to work for this victory, as the fight went on, you could see that pedigree starting to rise. Go ahead, Rob. And I think, um, I believe Chocolatito actually landed the, the um, sharper punches. While Valoria hits hard, I think, it's again, we talked about those little things, the different movements, and, not, and at times not to get hit that uh, Chocolatito was taking advantage of. So, yeah. um, it ended in a knockdown in the Knock fight. Out. Well, it was a TKO. Right. In the fight, but I believe Valoria was knocked down in, in the second round right. from a short right hand that he never saw. And of course, you know, if you want to really knock someone out, if they if you hit them with something they don't see, they're going down. Yeah, he he did get up and recover from that. 
and then had very good work afterwards. It was just as the fight started uh, going on, those precise punches from Gonzalez really took their toll and started to decrease the work rate of Valoria until it got to the point that the ref felt he had seen enough and stopped the fight in the ninth round after a combo from Gonzalez. So, really, uh, we're waiting on, uh, what's my man from Japan? Uh, Inoue? Yeah. We're waiting for him to either come over here or them to get Gonzalez to go over there. These guys got to meet. Well, actually, that shouldn't be hard because, remember, Chakazito was fighting in Japan for a really long time. Yeah. That's where he made his name at. Right. So, we got to get those two guys together and see who is the best in that division right now because a lot of people haven't seen Inoue. They're probably going to go with Gonzalez, and that's warranted because of how good he is, and he has knocked out some former champs, some great fighters. He needs that young lion on his resume to really submit it. Well, I mean, not really, but... He just needs to, another champ. Mm. Yeah. Um, we were talking off camera, like, if, if he's at, what, 44-0 now? 44-0, no, 38 knockouts. So... Maybe we start talking about him as the best ever. Who knows? But a lot of people don't give those little guys credit that they should get. But not only is this guy technically sound, but he's knocking people out at the lower weight classes that people say they can't punch. But there's plenty of punches down in the lower weights. Oh, yeah. I don't know what they're talking about. Let's move on to the main event. And in this one, we got Gennady Golovkin versus David Lemieux. And what we talked about in the preview video was if... Lemieux did not get started early and pushing Golovkin back. This is going to be a long, one-sided fight. What we get robbed? A long, one-sided fight. Exactly. I mean, this was probably the first guy we've seen against um, Golovkin that really came to him. So that jab was really, really, really highlighted. I mean, he was landing that bad boy at will. Like, all night. For some reason, Lemieux forgot that he was supposed to move his head or something. But I don't know what game plan they had. But man, this thing got sad really quick. I thought it'd get sad maybe about four or five rounds. It started getting sad after like two rounds. Uh, Golovkin just showed, first of all, a textbook jab used in a variety of different ways. Power jab, jab to set it up, jab when moving back, jab to keep him at bay. It was just, and it wasn't a jab fest, we're just saying, it was a thing of beauty to watch. Oh yeah, I mean, when you see somebody unleashing a jab like that, you just gotta give them props. I mean, a lot of, we say this time and time again about people just going on about his power. This guy is a technical marvel. He can punch correctly, he can place his punches accurately, even that weird overhand that he throws, it still gets to his target. And because he's throwing it to still land those knuckles, I mean, the guy is the goods. So what if he hasn't fought any other big names? You know the goods when you see it. The guy's the goods. Even if he doesn't go up and like fight the light heavyweights and super middleweights, he can just rule the middleweight division and just beat everybody there and cement his name there. There shouldn't be a problem with that. Now, keep in mind, that's not the only thing that was on full display. Great head movement, great rim generalship, great balance, great power, of course. Yeah. He just also a great chin because in the seventh round, Lemieux hit him with a nasty left hook right hand and Golovkin walked right through it. Like, you could hear it. Like, that was probably the hardest punches he had landed the entire fight, and Golovkin walked right through him. Now, me, if I was fighting him, at Lemieux, I probably would have not tried to jab my way in because he wasn't going to win. Lemieux doesn't really have a good jab, nor does he have the arm length to really take advantage of the jab against a guy who has long arms and a much better jab. Yeah, he could at least move his head or something. I would have just gone with the old... Bob and Weave, get in there and try to muscle him up against the ropes. He never got close to Golovkin. No, at all. Which is like we said, this guy had the range on lock all night. 
with the footwork and the jab. I mean, we can sit here all day praising Golovkin, but we just got to see what's, what's going to happen next. Who's going to step up to the plate now? And now apparently, Chris Eubank Jr. wants that next shot. He does have to beat somebody, a few people to earn that shot. But, I, you know, if you got somebody calling this guy out, give him a shot. Oh. We also have Peter Quillen out there. Uh, the winner of Golovkin, not Golovkin, the winner of Canelo and Cotto. Well, the winner of Canelo and Cotto, the winner of Jacobs and Quillen, and the winner of Lee and Billy Joe Saunders. Okay. Yeah, you got people out there for him. Then you got people moving up like Andre, uh, Laura wants to move up, um, the Charlo brothers in a few years probably. Mm -hmm. um, he's got people that are there to fight. And then, like we said, Eubank, once he gets that name up there, there are probably some other uh, European middleweights who have yet to make their name who can come up and challenge him as well. He's got people there if he sits still. He's not really that, that big of a middleweight. Um, if he moves up, he's going to be dealing with much bigger guys, both physically and dimension-wise, like arm length, height, all of that stuff. Especially with guys like Quillen, um, or if Andre moves up, because Andre is what, like 6'1"? He's like 6'1", 6'2", but I was talking about the super middleweights. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't know if he really wants to go there. He might can get some of those guys, but some of them are just maybe a little too big, too fast for their size, or uh, just as good skill-wise. Yeah. But then that'll really test to see how good he is if he does move up and he can handle those guys. Mm -hmm. We still got questions. That's why we watch. So we're looking forward to seeing what he's got next. Anything else you want to add? Um, well, with that... It's already been said, Cotto's not fighting anyone at the full 160. He'll be fighting guys about 155 to 157. Um, that sucks, but it is what it is. He he's is, the money guy. He's the money guy, yeah. He demands what he wants. Canelo has already said that he's not going to be campaigning at 160. Um, he'll probably still be trying to fight at 154 or even 155. Again, money guy can almost do what he wants. He's going to be the A-side. Yeah. So until, and then I'm hearing that the numbers for this fight didn't do well. Canelo and Cotto are going to use that against Golovkin if he is to fight them. Like, he's not going to be able to demand a high purse. He's not going to be able to demand a weight or any of that. Um, but K2 Promotions has done a great job with promoting him and getting him to fight. He fights, what, three to four times a year? Yeah, and that's really important, too. So... We'll probably see him in the early part of next year, maybe like February, against someone. Someone will step up to the plate, and we'll see what we got. Thanks for watching, guys. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Make sure you give it a thumbs up. Make sure you share it with your friends. Uh, if you guys got anything you want to add, you know you can hit us in the comments section. You can hit us up on Facebook, Google+, Instagram, Capital of Combat. You can hit us up on our email, capitalcombat at gmail.com. Any questions you guys got, hit us up in any of those venues, get you in the combat mailbag, and we all working on some new technical toolbox. I think we're going to be doing some MMA stuff with that too. So all you MMA fans out there, or if you know somebody that is an MMA fan, let them know to be watching out for those videos. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video. Peace. This is round one, and you've already lost. They don't seem to see that everything we've done is coming and gone. My fists are on fire. I perform till I perspire. My demons are in a rage. Keep thinking that it's the game. I kick rhyme, hurricane. I told them I don't play. I'm liquid. Black Street Fighter. Street Fighter.